To set things up, I'll talk for a few minutes about the state of digital training and coaching and share uh, at a high level what's going on in this ever-growing market. Um, Bill Richardson, our Chief Revenue Officer, will talk with a few industry experts and influencers about what they're doing and how they've adjusted uh, to you know, incorporate uh, digital training in 2020, but also where do they see it going? Um, then really excited for Ryan Marshall, our VP of Operations. He's actually gonna walk through how to design um, a, a curriculum, a, a digital curriculum, which should be very valuable. Um, we should be able to finish with enough time to do a Q and A, uh, but if there are questions, feel free to insert them in the box. We'll make sure we address them in real time or we'll get to them afterwards. Obviously just uh, you know, stay away from any mean comments about my hairstyle or, uh, or any of the pictures of my kids behind me. Other than that, everything is game. So, um, keeping in, in, uh, in tune, right, anybody who saw Jeremy, you know, today or has been to any of these with league apps, uh, run these sessions, they always start with a relevant quote to frame the discussion, right? So here goes our attempt uh, at, at staying in line with that. We quote the great one, Wayne Gretzky, a good hockey player plays where the puck is, a great player plays where the puck is going to be. A big part of what we want to get to today, obviously, is where is the world going and how does your you know, great organizations adjust um, not only to the times we're in today, but really where it's going in the future. So hopefully you guys get something out of that. Um, and before we move on, um, we always, we're going to um, integrate a couple of poll questions. I hope you guys, guys don't mind, um, but we're going to pop up a question. And the first is just a yes or no, right? Big picture. Um, did you offer some sort of virtual coaching in 2020? You know, anything from, you know, an app like Famer or Zoom or Facebook Live or something through your website, website, just a yes or no, but anybody that can, uh, um, that can answer, that would be great. And then we'll, uh, we'll tabulate the responses, but it's, you know, it's just good to see kind of who's doing what. I'll give you guys a second to do that. Um, so moving on. Um, keeping kids engaged and competitive online, right? And I think one thing that this year taught us is we have to be prepared for anything and everything. It's a, certainly a key theme of 2020. Digital coaching should help you do that. And not only should help you do that now, but it really should make your program better. Um, the whole uh, vision of digital coaching is how do we reach more kids more efficiently and effectively, but still in a personalized and a customized manner? Right, we want you guys to be able to continue that great mentorship and player development as an extension and enhancement of the great work that you're already doing in person on the courts and the fields. This is not meant to solely replace what you're doing. It's always meant to extend and enhance. And obviously we'll get into some key tricks and tips on how we think you keep kids engaged and, and, and interested. Um, big picture, we at FAMER, but also I think the industry as a whole, we also want to democratize personal coaching and training. What that means is we want to make it much more affordable and accessible to many more people, right? Um, this hopefully will not only create value to your customers inside your ecosystem, but also connect, you know, club, coaches, players, and parents together in a way that, that isn't being done today. And we're hoping that, you know, digital coaching and training can do that. Okay, so moving on. Um, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a quick look back. I know no one wants to look back at this year, but as you know, um, you learn as much in the worst of times than you do in the best of times. So, um, you know, Fairman was around before COVID, but I think we all learned a lot about ourselves, our organizations, and, you know, seeing just sort of how we adjusted, right? In March in 2020, Suddenly, everybody was wiped off the field at the time. We didn't know how long, right? I personally had many, many games that I was coaching canceled, as just like you guys did. Um, and it ended up being around three months, and obviously, many of us are still being um, affected. Uh, but time, you know, the time changed, and the only way you were going to communicate with your athletes was through some sort of a virtual digital technology. Some of you were already working with virtual tech platforms. Some of you already had content or programming created, right? Most of you probably jumped in in some way, shape, or form, potentially with off-the-shelf skills or drills through an app or through YouTube or something like that. Um, you figured out, obviously, how to go live stream through Zoom and Facebook Live for the first time. And for the first time ever, you're coaching kids on a computer, but you figured it out, right? You, you figured out some way to keep the kids active. Um, but we, as we know, there were a lot of challenges because we didn't see this coming. Um, you know, how do you organize this type of content and programming? 
what content do you use? Um, you know, do you go live? Do you order something? You know, do you offer something more asynchronous? We saw, you know, on Famer, coaches filming full curriculums inside little bedrooms or in hallways or in alleyways or in a patch of grass somewhere. It was incredibly exciting to see what was going on, but we also realized what a challenge it was, right? Can you charge for this, right? Is there a way to bring all the programs together under one, you know, one place? And then obviously what we know that many of you were going through was how do we keep the kids engaged without, you know, breaking our business and giving all the money back or rendering services that were already paid for? It was a challenge we all faced. So moving on. So now, you know, going forward, right? The goal is how do you extend your program virtually? Most of you have done the work. You have created your own special way of coaching and teaching and training and communicating and, and mentorship, right? That's what makes your program different. It's the people, it's the personalities, it's the way that you guys teach, train, and communicate. Um, your secret sauce, how do we turn that into um, a, a virtual programming and training as an extension and enhancement of what you're already doing? So next, I'm just gonna talk about um, things that we see that really make up a great virtual program, right? We obviously know, right, not every coach, club, sport, athlete, or location is the same, right? But in general, we believe that great programs include the following. First, we start off with mobile first, right? We know coaches and administrators like to engage on desktop, so that's perfect for the coach and the administrator um, to be on a computer. But kids and parents um, for that will always be on their phones. They always go mobile first, right? If you don't, if you don't know that, then you don't know kids because kids are obviously attached to their phone. Secondly, how do we bring this intellectual property that you guys have created uh, to life through digital, right? With the goal, like I said, of extending, enhancing what you do on the field. Virtual gives you a chance to create content and programming that can live with your philosophy, right? Your fields, your coaches, your colors, your sponsors. So it feels very personalized and localized. Third, um, we always, you know, at FAMER, we talk about, you know, everything comes down to the content, right? And we can help you with that. And there's a lot of great resources out there to help you with that. And when we say content, we always think about it in terms of short form, actionable mobile video, right? What that means is um, we live in a TikTok world where kids are, they're in and they're out. If you start giving kids five, seven, 10 minute videos, for the most part, they're checked out pretty quickly. If you give them what they need to do in the, and you package it in a way that tells them what you're doing, shows them what you're doing, and then lets them go do it, that we're seeing as incredibly valuable and two-way communication and the engagement is, is, has been incredible. Um, next, some sort of two-way feedback and communication, right? Um, this offers accountability needed and a commitment by the club to hold athletes accountable, right? Just like in school, if your teacher is expecting you to do something, you have to do it. The same should be true, obviously, with your coach or your club or your trainer. Good programs also will offer you back-end analytics. So you can really see, like, what's happening, what's working, what content is performing, are the kids doing the work? Are they staying with the work that they're supposed to do? And are the coaches providing the mentorship that you expect them to provide? Now, this is really important for a couple of reasons, but mainly because you want to make sure that your investment or whatever you're doing around digital training is working and you want to optimize it and adjust so you continue to build something that keeps getting better, cleaner, stronger. Um, next, we talk about holistic training, right? Virtual, in a lot of ways, people think about it starts with skills and drills and moves, but really over time, whether it's at the beginning or over time, should integrate things like leadership and mentorship and teamwork and fitness and mindfulness. We have a lot of great clubs during the winter knowing that kids won't be out playing basketball because it's going to be snowing. So they're, do, they're working on other parts of their game, things that they can do in an indoor location. So continually thinking about content and programming on how do I really train the kid, not just through skills and drills. Um, consolidation, right? So again, the more you can integrate programs, like we said before, you're seeing a lot of disparate solutions all over the place. The more you can have, you know, whether it's your live streaming, you know, combined with your asynchronous, combined with your two-way communication on one platform as an integrated solution, the better. Um, I think that's a really important part. And then I'd say the last part, but probably the most obvious, which is make it 
fun, right? And simple and easy and actionable. Don't over complicate things. Now we have clubs and organizations that are using the product and the wit and digital training and coaching in an unbelievable way with game concepts and breaking down film and really, you know, breaking things down in a way that's so next level, but you don't have to start there. This is a uh, digital coaching should be what um, works for you and your organization and your customer set. So we always say, make sure that you are um, designing it for what you can handle. And what this should do, it should lead to better player, you know, and coaching development, which is, you know, really important. A deeper connection between the ecosystem of club coach, athlete, and parent, which is extremely important. New programming that allows you to extend your brand and should provide you with a, with a new revenue stream or increased value. And then finally, better humans, right? We know that not many of these kids are going to go on to be professional athletes or uh, get D1 scholarships. We would love all of them to, but the reality is they're all going to grow up to be adults. So the things that you're teaching them now are as important as anything. And digital and virtual coaching allows you to extend and enhance all those things that you can't get to sometimes on the field and group and team training. Okay. So um, our next question, and I'll pause here just very quickly for a second, is do you think in-person training sessions will be negatively affected by COVID in 2021? Um, we assume most of you will say yes, but I don't want to, I don't want to skew any of the answers. Um, but this is something that, you know, again, we're all dealing with and hopefully with the news that's been coming out, it's a short term, um, situation, but you know, it's a, it's an interesting question because how you adjust to the next handful of months, I think is going to be extremely important. Okay. All right, so this last slide before I, uh, I bring up um, Bill Richardson, our chief revenue officer. Bill's gonna actually talk with two great influencers and youth sports administrators that'll be able to share their insights on what they're dealing with. Go ahead, Bill, take it away. Excellent, thank you, Rich. Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Richardson, the chief revenue officer at Famer, and I'm excited to welcome to the stage Two gentlemen that I know have thought a lot this year about virtual training and how to stay connected to their athletes through digital channels, probably a lot more than they ever thought they would, right, Eddie? Yeah. <laughs> um, they've each brought different aspects of virtual and remote coaching to their organizations, and we wanted to bring them up here to talk about their experiences. Uh, Eddie comes to us from Washington State. He's the technical director at a top club there, ISC Gunners. He enjoyed a successful career as a player on a few of our youth national teams, enjoyed a stellar college career, and went on to play uh, professionally as well. He has an A coaching license uh, from the U.S. Soccer Federation and also serves on the board of U.S. Club Soccer. Welcome, Eddie. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. Mike Rio founded Basketball World Toronto in 2006 and has built it into one of the premier basketball programs in Canada. Mike has been coaching for over 15 years and for a long time has been a leader and advocate for integrating sports and technology in his business. So thanks for joining us, Mike. Thanks for having Appreciate me. It. Of course. Uh, I always say, you know, you sports coaches are unsung heroes for our kids. Um, I think it's true every year, but this year, I think it was even more evident. Coaches were not just player development experts, mentors and motivators, like they always are, but they became Wi-Fi gurus, uh, camera operators and producers, DJs on Zoom sessions, <laughs> and a lot more. Um, so first, on behalf of parents everywhere, um, I want to thank you guys, thank all the coaches in the room as well, uh, for going the extra mile this year uh, to take care of your kids, your families, your communities, and your organizations. Uh, and thanks, uh, Eddie and Mike, for joining us today for the discussion. Um, Eddie, I, I wanted to start with you. Um, can you tell me, you know, were you doing any digital or virtual training uh, before COVID uh, really hit? And uh, how did you respond, you know, once COVID restrictions kicked in? Yeah, we were doing a little bit of uh, video stuff, but it was more on a, you know, sort of individual basis and just trying to hone in on on specific athletes who needed a little bit of extra training um, to maybe you know, better them. So it wasn't anything that we needed on the large scale, like when COVID hit. And we were a little bit forward thinking. Um, I've been doing this a long time. So I, I went through 9-11, I went through uh, 2008. And 
you know, knew about crises and we thought, you know what, we might get shut down. So we started, um, we started to, um, you know, get out ahead of it and shoot a lot of video before the COVID, they shut us down. And we were lucky because we shot a lot of content and, um, you know, thought it would be good enough, but then, you know, obviously this lasted eight months. So we had to go back to the drawing board, but um, we were successful to get out of, out ahead of it. And, and we were not lucky, just, you know, forward thinking that if we get shut down, we need to be prepared. So that's awesome. Yeah. And Mike, uh, and same question to you, you know, COVID hit, you know, we were taken off the courts and fields. Um, had you been doing anything at that time and, and kind of how, what was your experience like? Sure. Uh, I mean, for us, uh, our the transition we've been working on for the past, I would say, a couple of years is trying to just digitize a lot of our training content, so our coaches would have access to a lot of the content and be able to uh, be able to well, be able to use it for their coaching needs. But really, the digital coaching part of it, uh, it was basically non-existent. It, it wasn't something we were doing outside of a you know an odd game where we'd be recording something like that at the rep or AAU level. But at least by having at least our content digitally. Uh, you know, digitally organized. It was great. Of course, this is still, you know, was done in a note taking system was a lot of it was text and not really interesting or really hard to kind of communicate to our coaches what exactly to do. Uh, and obviously, as we were heading towards the pandemic and things started to see that way, I started to get sort of things wrapped around as to how we might go about making a transition to use digital content, uh, video recordings, things like that to showcase this content not only to the coaches who are teaching it but also to the the kids themselves so that they can learn and, and really facilitate their learning along the way yeah i mean you definitely have a lot of constituencies to kind of please when it comes to rolling out something like this you've got your coaches you know that you support you know you've got the kids and parents that need to be taken care of yeah um, and so you know you mentioned a challenge you know around organizing all this stuff um back to you mike uh, what were some of the you know some of the challenges that you had to overcome initially in terms of getting started. This is kind of new for, for most coaches. So for all the coaches out there that are, are looking at it, you know, what kinds of uh, things did you have to solve uh, early on? Yeah, I would say it's probably just being as, as organized as possible and just trying to make sure you kind of document everything that you have in your in your repertoire and, and kind of add, add in all the coaches knowledge that, you know, we all have in our heads, but we don't necessarily have written down in some type of format. Uh, and then obviously organizing in a format that makes sense to the various different types of, um, uh, of programs that you're rolling out, because obviously some of the content was even not applicable to certain uh, certain programs. Uh, and then from there, trying to determine what would be the recordings that we would actually need to secure and do uh, and move forward with. Because once you've got them written down, then you can, for lack of a better, start to knock them off in terms of the things that you have to record. But just trying to stay organized and getting on top of it and knowing what you have at your disposal and what you don't have, what you need, what you're going to need in the future, I think was one of the biggest challenges, just trying to stay organized on everything. Yeah. And, and Eddie, I know you moved very quickly. Um, and what sorts of things did you guys face when you uh, initially launched this? I think the biggest challenge, I, first I'd say I'd echo what Mike said, but our biggest challenge was content. Um, we basically had to not rewrite our curriculum. We had to shoot it. And, you know, we have over 2,000 players. And at the recreational level and then three levels of premiere so we had to shoot content for all of those age groups and basically send get that information out to the parents so the players could actually you know train the other big you know challenge i think was trying to come up with a platform that could address everyone's needs on an individual basis because unless you had assembly you also couldn't train with anyone so we had to find content that an individual could use that would keep them at their level and not drop. So that was a challenge, but uh, I think we met it and we did two phases and the second phase, you know, we took a step back and said, okay, and it got better. And it's, it's been really good though for us. Yeah. It's been really good. Yeah, I mean, you've got to obviously consider not just the fact that they don't have uh, friends and buddies to, to practice with, but they might have limited space. And so, you know, the content that you filmed, you know, two months ago might not necessarily be applicable, you know, today. So as you, you're planning out a curriculum, as you're planning out a video library, if you're planning out all of your content, you know, taking it from what's up here and what's on a PDF and a schematic and a diagram and putting that on film uh, just requires a little bit of thought and organization, I guess, going back to what Mike said as a, as a key 
takeaway is, you know, get that stuff organized. Um, and then the shooting, you know, is, is a little bit simpler. And I would say, I just jumped in there. Sorry, I just jump in for a second that the, yeah. we're actually, you know, we, we were going through the recording phase while the pandemic was hitting. So trying to figure out how long exactly would be obviously closed for, what content we would need in the interim, how long would we need to have this content for. So uh, it's good to hear that Eddie, you were able to get it in advance of obviously closing. Uh, we were kind of, for lack of a better word, recording or trying to record it during the actual, you know, the first, the first couple of weeks, if not month of it. And trying to figure out what we need along the way is it's hard, especially while you're dealing with everything else that's still going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so Eddie, back back to you. Um, how do you see? You know, now that you've you know we've all been living with this uh, for the last eight months, and and kind of looking forward, as Rich was saying, describing. You know, Famer was built around the idea of uh, of uh, virtual coaching being a complement to what's going on on the field. So we all hope we'll be on the fields again soon. But how do you see visual uh, virtual? coaching and digital coaching and remote learning kind of having a place, you know, once we are back on the fields, where do you see it going kind of long-term within your organization? Um, longer term. I mean, we, we see a lot of good in this. Um, you know, there's things that happen all the time, whether it's bad weather, you have to cancel. I know uh, before COVID hit last summer, we had fi fires. And so we had to shut down for two weeks because the air quality was so poor. So now we've got a, we've got a library that we can tap into and send that information out. But I think the biggest thing is that we can actually now use that content to send to players as things that they can do to better themselves. You know, if they want an extra training or something like that, where we couldn't provide that before. And, and now we've got the content to do that. So Going forward, I think the digital platform is going to become a part of definitely what we do because there's a need for it. Um, it addresses a lot of issues when players can't be there. Uh, kids go on vacation and they miss two weeks of training. Okay, take this with you. While you're on vacation, take your ball. So yep. now there's no excuse for them to fall behind. So it's it's been a godsend for us. That's right. And I know you guys have a, a rec program along with your more competitive uh, programs. And uh so I can Absolutely. envision that being a good way to stay in touch with those rec players, you know, kind of cultivate that relationship with the rec families, bring them into the fold, give them exposure to some of your top end coaches. Um, and then, you know, ultimately those players will develop into people that join your, your uh, competitive programs. Eddie, we might, we might've lost uh, Eddie frozen a little bit. So Mike, back to you. Um, how do you see this kind of uh, you know, virtual coaching world manifesting itself within uh, your organization? Yeah, I think I think I'd probably ed echo uh, what Eddie was talking about there. It's basically going to become a hybrid model. Absolutely, you you froze out there for a second. I'm not sure if it was my computer or yours, but uh, sent and um, it keeps those rec players engaged. In fact, um, we kind of send out content for them on a on a weekly basis just to keep them engaged because they have a shorter season. But um, you know, the premier kids play for 10 months and they just have a shortened season. So we send out content to them just to keep them engaged, to get them excited for the spring and then, you know, back in the fall for next year as well. Awesome. Cool. Uh, Mike? Uh, yeah. So I think the, the hybrid model of having, you know, this type of coaching available for kids is I think is going to be integral moving forward. Obviously, uh, Eddie was mentioning just you know, having absenteeism for various different reasons. You had fires, things like that. I mean, we have bad weather up in Canada, as, as many other places do. You know, you just can't do things on your own. And so having access to this content, I think, is is very valuable. I think it's also going to make the, the quality of coaching that we can provide to our kids a, a sort of a, a, a step up because it's complementing what we're doing in person. Uh, it's just reinforcing the content. It's uh, even allowing the kids to work on it on their own. Sometimes some kids are, you know, able to learn faster, better, quicker, you know, if they see it themselves and can kind of practice it. So I, I think it's the hybrid model is the way it's going to be moving forward. And I'm looking forward to, you know, making a better quality of coaching for the kids out there because I think ultimately it'll be it'll be a better solution for them. That's awesome. That's what it's all about. That's a great, great place to kind of wrap up this this section of our presentation. So thanks again, Eddie. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, players and uh, families in your programs are lucky to have you. Good luck uh, ongoing. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, I'm going to pass it over uh, to Ryan Marshall, who's going to walk you through uh, things to consider when designing a virtual curriculum for your program. Thanks, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's great to meet you. I'm Ryan Marshall. 
I'm the VP of operations for Famer. I oversee the team that is responsible for working with our partners to realize their potential in using virtual training and helping them develop their training content, curriculum, and distribution strategy utilizing the Famer platform. During this portion of the workshop, I'm going to walk you through the considerations that organizations, coaches, and trainers need to make in order to build out and execute a successful coaching curriculum. While we are certainly in challenging times where digital may be the only way to train your athletes, we focus and align our strategies with partners as a true extension and enhancement of the way they teach, coach, and train in person. So our goal here is to really help you guys understand how this can be something that's achievable, you can execute on it. It really shouldn't take much more effort than you are already doing with your in-person curriculum. And that's really where we come in and being great consultants and helping this be uh, something that, you know, really is a great tool for you and your organization. So first and foremost, what are organizers and coaches trying to accomplish with virtual training? Typically, it starts with player development. Organizations use virtual training to work on what they don't get to teach on the field, both from an individual perspective and also a team training perspective. This is also a great way to work on what we consider to be holistic development, where organizations, coaches, and trainers focus on mental conditioning, confidence building, film study, schematics, strength and conditioning, and more. This is also how organizations can develop players in the community that may not necessarily be a part of their program to begin with. The next thing, and this is COVID notwithstanding, as Mike and Eddie both mentioned, inclement weather or any other reasons why you weren't able to have your in-person sessions, virtual and digital is a great way for you to replace those sessions and really make sure that you always have that extension and enhancement to what you're doing with your families. Next, we see organizations really loving using virtual to allow for that two-way communication and feedback. This allows them to continue working and building the relationships with their athletes and families. It allows them to really be true mentors outside of the times that they're physically with those athletes and families. Next is distributing training content as a value add. This is specifically for our rec and developmental programs to help prep them uh, for you know whatever they want to do, whether it's to go on and be a club player, whether it's to engage and participate in a sport better, and really help them achieve milestones in advancement. And then finally, really what we see a lot of organizations enjoying using is creating, uh, using virtual training to create a new and appropriate relevant revenue stream. This can be focused specifically on one-to-one -one training uh, for players outside of your program, or it can be used, you know, for your, you know, for your existing, um, you know, players and families. Uh, really what we look at virtual training is how do you guys show off what makes you special? That's your coaches and your curriculum. And we want virtual training to help you show this as a competitive differentiator for your program and your brand. So next is who utilizes virtual training within an organization? You know, virtual training allows a great opportunity to provide training up and down every audience of your organization. It starts with your rec players to receive a value add to participate better. It transitions to the developmental players who aspire to learn the game and grow into a more serious competitive player. Then there's the competitive players who can really use virtual training to not only improve physically, but also develop their game mentally and receive valuable mentorship from their coaches. Additionally, in the last year alone, we've seen a significant increase in the demand for organizations to distribute their coaching curriculum um, to their coaches, no matter where their coaches are. This is even more relevant for organizations that have coaches spread out across multiple locations. So who leads this initiative for an organization? It really is from the top down and bottom up. You know, first it starts with the administrators. They're the ones that need to have the vision and desire to execute and provide the value and development up and down the organization. Then it moves on to the technical directors. They are the ones who will work to build out the curriculum, both from an individual and team perspective. Then we move on to directors of coaching. They are the ones who will distribute and implement the strategy across the coaching staff and oversee the ultimate success of the programming. Then there's the coaching staff. They're the boots on the ground. They're the ones who are distributing the content, communicating with their teams and families, as well as providing feedback. And then another really interesting development over the last few months is organizations establishing a digital director of coaching or a director of digital coaching. This is a new position that we have really worked with partners to help establish. These are technologically savvy coaches who are overseeing the digital strategy and distribution of that training content. They're providing communication and feedback across the organization. So this can really help out organizations that may have staff that don't feel comfortable necessarily using virtual and digital. So they have people that are able to really you know, fill that void. 
And then finally, you know, you can deter, you know, how do organizations buy in and drive excitement for their stakeholders? You can determine your objectives, how you want to accomplish them, determine the audience and the club and who will execute it. But it's absolutely critical to get buy in and drive excitement for your organization's stakeholders. This excitement is driven by the value that athletes, families, and coaches experience. So on the athlete side of things, you know, this allows them to have enhanced communication with their coaches, receive workouts and feedback to improve, and also increase their practice time. Then we transition to families. This, become, this allows a family and parents to become more involved in their child's training program, as well as get a clearer view of their progress. And then finally, the coaches. This allows them to enhance their engagement with their athletes, increase accountability, as well as earn additional income. So as I go through the, how to create your content, create a virtual curriculum, establish a distribution strategy, I wanna continually remind you guys to keep it simple. These are three major facets of running a successful virtual program. Again, you guys are the experts on the curriculum and we're just gonna teach you how to package it through digital. So first and foremost, determine what content you wanna create and for what audience. Again, recreational, developmental, competitive. Two, package that content into a curriculum that can be distributed to your athletes and families. Again, this is what you guys are already experts at. And then three, this is where a partner like Famer can really come into play. We can help you create a schedule, a distribution plan, and communication strategy for your athletes and your families. So again, these three facets are the things that you should always keep in the back of your mind when you're trying to build out a successful virtual training curriculum. So when we look at how to tailor your content to your audience, we really break it down into two different categories, rec and developmental players and competitive and skilled players. And each category has its own specific nuances. So for the recreational and developmental players, you know, typically we're seeing that these are athletes between the ages of two and 10 years old. These are the content that you're capturing is skills and drills to help teach the fundamentals. You're really working towards achievable milestones that build from one week to the next. This content can be viewed and practiced individually or in small groups to encourage family participation. And then finally, to what Eddie mentioned earlier, this can be utilized as a retention tool to push workouts to athletes and families during the off season. Then we transition into the players. These are typically athletes between the ages of 10 to 18 years old. These, this content is for advanced skills and drills, but it also transitions into team drills, schematics, concepts, mental wellness, strength and conditioning. So it doesn't just stop, start and stop with the actual physical development. And then this is really gonna be used to create an atmosphere of accountability, competition, and fun. So what type of content works? So really, again, what we always say to anybody that we speak with is short form, actionable mobile video. Again, one to two minutes in length is what we really think works and have seen work well on our platform. Again, all of this content is, you know, works very well and we've seen them work uh, for a variety of different organizations uh, in different sports. Um, and it's not a one size fits all. Some organizations may wanna focus specifically on skills, drills, and moves, while others may wanna work across content across the board. This is ultimately up to your organization to determine, but we work with our partners to help determine this strategy. All of this drill content can then be packaged into workouts that can be delivered uh, as part of your curriculum. So again, we see it, skills, drills, and moves, team movements and concepts, mental health and wellness and performance, schematics and film study, and strength and conditioning. As far as best practices, you know, these are the main considerations you need to make when filming and producing your own training content. We are always happy to consult and work with our partners on how to make this content look and feel premium. Now, the first thing that we talk about is using a smartphone to, uh, to film your content. Now, with the quality of smartphone cameras, it's very possible to film great videos with your smartphone. It's also very inexpensive to purchase a tripod and keep a still frame. So if you wanna have a tripod, you can also invest in that. But many partners also, they prefer professional equipment or hiring a production staff to bring their content to life. The point is, you, there's no shortage of ways that you can capture great quality content of your training curriculum. The next thing to consider is the location. A great shooting location will be empty of people, away from street traffic, and most importantly, not windy. I can't tell you how many videos we've seen get you know, basically thrown in the trash because you can't hear what the coach is saying during their, during their descriptions. Next is you know, the positioning of the camera or and you being on, on film. So stand close to the camera. If you need to move away when demonstrating, make sure you do the explanation closer to the camera. Next, lighting. Daylight is sufficient, as is lighting from indoor facilities, 
But if you're going to be outside, make sure it's a beautiful day so that you have some good lighting. And then finally, we'll hit on this again, short form, actionable mobile video that's simple and engaging. Typically, we see the drill videos on our platform being between one and two minutes in length. Gone are the days where we're really seeing 10 to 20 minute drill videos. We want to be able to keep short form drills that are then packaged into workouts that you can then distribute out to your athletes. So the next thing that we're going to go into is how to design and execute a program. And we're going to start with the rec side of things. So now that you have your content in place for your specific audiences, it's time to set up and design this execution plan. The first part of the design of the curriculum is setting up your building blocks, whether rec or competitive uh, age, time of the year or season and progression is critical. Once the building blocks are set, you will focus on the structure of the actual work you will distribute. Specifically for rec programs, we see the following structure work very well. So again, you can see they have a warm up, a stretches routine, skill development drills, and then a fun game and competition. So again, this isn't what you guys would have to do. It, it's completely up to you, but this is the type of curriculum that we see works well, this type of structure that is then distributed out to athletes on the rec side of things. Again, typically each workout has 10 to 12 minutes worth of viewing content, which is about five or six drills. And then it typically takes the athletes another 20 to 30 minutes to complete the content once they're done watching the drills. So I then go into building out a sample curriculum for a rec program. You can see that it's broken out by the age group and then has the curriculum structure for each age group. Again, we typically see the following structure work well for records, but this is completely customizable and adaptable for however you want to construct and run your program. We then push this out across three months, which is the typical timeline for a rec program. You should be able to see that this doesn't look too dissimilar from the structure that you would provide for in-person training. It's just formatted and distributed specifically for virtual. So you can see here, you have your age groups, right? You have your program structure where you have warm-ups, skill development drills, fun and competitive games, milestones achieved, right? And you just replicate that across all your different age groups. The next thing that we say, that we show is that now that you have your curriculum worked through, we need to determine the best strategy to distribute out that curriculum and communicate that to drive engagement. Again, this is simple based on what we've seen work on our system for rec programs. You can really get an understanding here about how you can utilize virtual to extend and enhance your in-person offerings and increase value and retention within your program. So again, you start on a Sunday and let's say it's a game day or practice. After that game day of practice ends, you're able to assign the workout for the week. Let a couple days go by, your athletes and families are able to work on what you distribute out. Then in the middle of the week, you can send a progress or check-in notification. Provide some words of encouragement. Let them know that you're there and you want to help. And then let a few more days go by, and then the day before you're due to really meet again, you send a final check-in and message a word of excitement to the athlete and the family about seeing them again. So again, you're bridging the virtual world with the real world. And the goal here should be a simple, easy, and attainable strategy and execution plan. So now we're going to transition into the competitive side of things. The first part of the design of the curriculum is setting up your building blocks. As we mentioned before, whether it's record competitive, age, time of the year, and progression are critical. And you can see how the structure has actually changed to account for the type of development program a competitive player needs. This bridges, the, again, the physical with the mental and holistic side of training based on what competitive players need. So you can see on, this, on the right side of the screen, the structure, you have your warm up, a game concept review. So you, know, you really wanna provide that contextual detail to what the athletes would be doing during in-game or in-practice sessions, skill development drills, and then film study. So these are the types of things that we're seeing more competitive programs perform on our platform and film that type of content to fill that void. Then we also go into putting a sample curriculum together for a competitive program. You can see that it's broken out by age group. And then this program has the curriculum structure for each age group. Again, we typically see this structure work well for competitive organizations. It's customizable and adaptable for however you personally want to run your program. We then push this out for the purposes of this workshop for three months, but we typically see many competitive programs extend out for 10 months or the entire year. So this should really take cues from what you do in person, but it's structured to be distributed and extended to provide that enhancement of your training you provide. And then you, you can see here in the competitive, you know, we have warm-ups, game movement reviews, skill development drills, mental and cognitive training. So how are you mentoring? How are you developing confidence? 
and really then film study, which we know is very important for competitive players as they progress on. And then we put together a sample schedule for a competitive organization. So the strategy is to really distribute and communicate to drive that engagement for competitive programs. And this will differ from what you're doing with the rec side of your program. Again, this is a sample program. It's your choice how you would want to schedule and engage. But typically, the competitive side of the of, of uh, virtual training will have two to three workouts distributed throughout the week. There will be three or four drills within each workout. There's a combination of physical and mental training and film review, and you can really get an understanding here about how you can utilize virtual to extend and enhance your in-person offerings and increase the value and retention within your programs. Virtual should provide a greater connective tissue for you to check in and ask questions, provide words of encouragement, as well as feedback. So you can see, we start this week on a Monday. You assign the workout. The emphasis of the workout is on warm-ups and game movements review. You're providing words of encouragement, so you're staying connected. Typically, the next day, you'll have practice. You can check in and ask if the team has any questions on the workout you assigned the day before. On Wednesday, that workout from Monday is due. You're able to then assign another workout that's focusing on another part of what you want them to, to uh, train with. The next day, you have a practice, right? You're able to check in again, ask if they have any questions. Friday, that workout from Wednesday is due. And then you're able to just send them some film study that they should prep for for the games or tournaments during Saturday and Sunday. And again, you can always utilize the platform to provide that engagement and, and words of encouragement to your athletes. So the goal of the virtual of this virtual curriculum design workshop is to show you that this is an achievable initiative for your organization. It is something that can drive substantial value as a forward-facing part of your curriculum by extending and enhancing what you teach in person. We are here to help and answer any questions and help consult the industry how to make this into a reality. We want to be a resource for you all. So I'll now pass it back to Rich to discuss what the results of a successfully executed program looks like. Thanks, Ryan. So um, we appreciate you guys staying with that. That was obviously a lot of information and uh, um, as you can see, we're passionate, and I think one of the key things about results and even some of the questions that came up, and I'll try to talk very quickly, is um, there. we're still at the, you know, we're in the first quarter, the second inning, the, however you want to uh, phrase it, in this business. So we're building this together, right? So we always say at FEMER, we can't do this without you. So you might have ideas or ways of teaching and training and running this that are difference makers for the industry, but we realize this is a behavior that has exploded this year, but it's still at the very beginning. So what do results look like? Um, first and foremost, progression and development up and down your organization, right? We want your young developmental or recreational players to have the tools to improve, right? Because a lot of times that they don't. And we also want the more competitive players to be able to go get the prescribed workouts that they need to go get in. Um, a culture of accountability. Um, obviously, you know, many of you are able to spend a lot of time, three, four, five days a week, you know, when, you know, outside of a pandemic with your athletes on the field in games and tournaments and traveling and in practices, right? But this allows you to have this culture of accountability. As we know, um, we all get better when working alone. And those are the people that we see improvement from. An organized library of content for coaches to share, right? We think this is the gift that keeps on giving because you're gonna create this content and build this programming that you'll continue to, to layer in over time, but it's really gonna allow you to run a better organization. And it's something that you can use time and time again. We know in certain sports like lacrosse, the rules and things change constantly, but in some sports, you know, 80% of what, you're, what you create today, you can continue to build on, but you can use for many years to come. Innovation, um, you know, we always say like, your competitor is gonna be doing this, right? but they can't replicate the way that you teach and train and communicate. So that's the thing to always keep in mind. Retention, right? We always talk about, you know, retention and value. How do you keep kids engaged? And, you know, there was a good question in the Q&A about how do we charge for this? And like I said, we realize this is at the very beginning, right, of this journey. And you have a lot of things that you're already charging for. And again, us and Famer, like I said, we're, you know, youth sports, um, at experts and we have a big background in this so we know it's not just as simple as hey i'm just going to raise my fee however um if you're providing this type of programming and giving the kids an extension and enhancement of your program whether it's off season during the week throughout the season 
you're giving more value, right? And mom and dad, especially after what we saw this year, um, are willing to pay for value if they know that they have something that's going to, you know, help bring that ecosystem together and help their child get better. The age old question from mom and dad is, how do I get better, right? What can I do for my kid? This is a way to do that. Um, efficiency and effectiveness, again, we always talk about all those things that you can't get to in team and group training, you can now bring to life through digital as an extension. And remember, like, you know, kids um, forget, I think it's 50% of what they learn within five minutes of getting off the fields and courts. And then I think it's like 90 or 95% within like 24 hours. So even you're teaching and training them the right way, when they go home, you know, I always make the joke that when my son goes out and practices basketball, he's doing Kevin Durant, you know, one footed step back jump shots. That's not making him a better basketball player. So he needs that prescribed. And then lastly, peace of mind, right? Again, you know, we understand we're living in a unique time, but it's not just about a global pandemic, but it's rain outs or situations. So now you have programming to continue to keep your athletes and families involved. Um, and, there's, and you basically have an insurance plan. Let's go to the last slide, Ryan. So again, to wrap up our section, um, with a quote is our guy, Tommy Lasorda, um, who I found out uh, just got out of the ICU in the last 18 hours. So that's really good. I'm a lifelong Yankee fan. So um, I uh, didn't grow up a Tommy Lasorda fan, but did become a, a big fan of his in the way he uh, lives his life over the last bunch of years. Um, and in baseball and the business, there are three types of people, right? Those who make it happen, those who watch it happen, and those who wonder what happens. Um, right? We all want to be people that make it happen. We want to be ahead of the curve and thinking about not where's my program today, not is there just a global pandemic that I have to deal with, but what do I want my program to be? How am I building value and great athletes and humans for the future? And we think that digital training and programming is a great piece of that puzzle. It's not the whole answer. You will never replace what happens on the courts and fields individually and in person, but this is always meant to be that extension and enhancement and that piece that allows you to, you know, continue to create not only better athletes, but better humans. So I'll stop right there. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you to League Apps for our continued partnership. We know this was a mouthful. Hopefully you learned something. And I know there's some questions that we'll get to, but I think we're out of time and we'll make sure we follow up with each and every one of you and come see us at our table. And we're happy to answer questions. And like I said, like, just consult you on what's happening in this industry. We're, we're happy to do that for you. So thank you, everybody.